I know we are Episcopalians, but please, somebody tell me Christ is risen. Christ is risen. All right, that's pretty good. Somebody tell me Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Oh my goodness, I was so worried I was going to have to turn on the Baptist tradition from whence I did not come. <laughs> Thank you. Christ is risen and Jesus is alive and everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. Years ago, there was an Easter morning when I was driving to church. And uh, between leaving my house and getting to church, I, I was listening to this gospel radio station. And I heard three different songs in which someone said, everything is going to be all right. It was a pastor speaking to a member of the church or somebody at a revival, sort of convicted of their sin and about to come forward and give their life to Jesus Christ. But no matter what the context, somebody said, everything is going to be all right. And that, that's a pretty good distillation of the gospel, right? Everything is going to be okay. God is in control of this, and by virtue of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything is going to be all right. For it, it is foolishness to some, but to those who are called, it is the power and the glory of God, that, that cross that brings us resurrection, that, that instrument of reconciliation, that, that glorious transformed instrument of death. Turned into life. If you lost me a minute ago when I started using church language, I understand. I understand because in part, all those churchy words I just used, they're an awful long way from the gospel we just heard. The gospel we just heard ends with these three people who have gone and, and seen Jesus' empty tomb and been told, Okay, go. He's alive. Tell everybody. He'll meet you there. And what do they do? They run away and they don't say anything. They run away and they don't say anything because they're afraid. It's a great example of what churches do, which is smooth out the rough edges. This is a rough edge in the story. It is a peculiar detail. It makes sense to smooth it out because also... If that's how the story ends, it's a very unsatisfying ending. That's the end of the Gospel of Mark in its original, probably, format. The Gospel of Mark, it just ends with these people running away and saying nothing. What an unsatisfying ending, right? I mean, if this were a movie, and there's lots of movies about it, right? Jesus it would show us the empty tomb, right? And maybe we would get this close-up on Jesus' head, still wrapped in a cloth. And the camera would pan down his body. And we would see a finger twitch, go to black. End of the movie, right? Might do that. Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ. Uh, but it ends with Jesus sitting on a rock inside the tomb and standing up and walking out. Or if you're going to make a movie about it, maybe you could you know, continue the story after this where he meets the disciples, teaches some more, and ultimately ascends into heaven. That would be a good place to end the story too. But I don't think any movie I've ever seen about Jesus ends with people running away and doing nothing. It's a weird ending. Dead bodies don't come back. And when people get news like that, they probably don't just keep it to themselves. And it doesn't really make any sense, sort of plot-wise, either. Because if these people had run away and never told anybody else a thing that they had heard about this Jesus being resurrected, we would not be here. No one would know. The church would not exist. The story of Christ's resurrection would never have been told. Now, there are um, multiple Responses to this strangeness, <clears throat> this strange ending to the Gospel of Mark. There are uh, two different extra endings that were written later and tacked onto it in different versions. They incorporate elements of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Or there's the theory that, well, maybe there was an ending, but the last page fell off. That's more plausible than it sounds, given the you know, condition of manuscripts and such at the time. But maybe, maybe it was on purpose that way. Maybe we're supposed to hear the story that way. So let's imagine, 
Let's imagine that we are Christians. We are in, well, let's say we're in Corinth, since we just heard a letter to the Corinthians. We're sitting in Corinth. We're in somebody's house. We're gathered together. And somebody's there to tell us the story again. You know, oral tradition time. People memorize things. They go around. They recite them. And somebody is here tonight to recite the gospel of Jesus. And, you know, she tells the story from the beginning. We'll say this is Mark, right? So Jesus shows up as an adult, teaches, heals, uh, does amazing miracles, is killed, rises from the dead, and they run away and say nothing. Imagine you're sitting there when you hear that. Imagine that they have said that, and so then you look at the person you're telling, telling you this story, and you say, well, what's next? And she says, you tell me. Perhaps this story as it is written and preserved in the Gospel of Mark, is designed to provoke us to something. Perhaps it is designed to make us think, well, nobody told, they didn't tell anybody about it. What's next? Well, you tell me. Maybe it's my job. What happens next? We follow Jesus. What happens next? We strive to be faithful disciples. We Tell the world what happens next. We become the light and the love and the body of Jesus Christ. We bring other people along and we baptize them. Got two of those today. I'm very, very excited. We're witnesses to the resurrection. We are people who have received the good news that Christ is alive. We get to decide how we will respond. We can witness to it in our lives or we can hide that light under a bushel. Well, what a gift to live it. What a gift to witness to it. What a gift to live in joy. Joy, not happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Joy, that lives in the core of us. Joy is what opens our hearts in challenging moments to seek the presence of God. Joy is what reminds us that no bad, no matter how bad things get, God is with us, and we are not alone. We witness to the resurrection when we forgive. We witness to the resurrection when we work for justice in this world. We witness to the resurrection when we love, when we love as instruments of God's eternal and unstoppable love. So what happens next is us. This community gathered, sharing good news with one another. What's next is these children about to be baptized into the new life of Christ. What's next is good news for a world that needs so much to hear it. That God loves us. That we're not alone. That we are called to serve together and to love as God in the world. God's body in Christ. What's next is us picking up where the disciples left off. What's left is to speak life. Life in the face of death. What's left is to speak justice for the oppressed and mercy for the hungry and the imprisoned and the sick and those who, like the Son of Man, have no place to lay their head. What's next is to embrace joy, proclaim hope, and to stand, stand every day against death and say life, life, life. In the name of Jesus Christ, life. In the promises that we will make today for these children being baptized, life. What is next is to embrace this truly unsettling truth that Christ who was dead is now alive and who lives with us, what is next is to embrace that and to say again and again and again, life, life, life. So one more time. Somebody tell me Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Oh, thank goodness. Now I'm going to try to do that with a little bit more enthusiasm and see if I can get a little bit more enthusiasm out of y'all. Somebody tell me Christ is risen. Woo! Yes! Jesus is alive! Jesus is alive!
And with God's help, you and I and these children to be baptized today will be witnesses of that truth, that love, that grace, that mercy, that justice, that joy to all the world. Amen.